Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, The section of God's Word that we'll look at today is our Gospel lesson, uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. We heard it read just a few moments ago from the lectern. Uh, We'll hear again just the opening verse of that text right now where it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And this is God's word. Uh, So maybe if you're a parent, uh, you might have heard something like this before. And it's quite simple. The question is, can I have one? Except it's usually not just can I have one. It's usually more like, can I have one? 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 Oh, please, it's just one. Can I have it? Can I have it? Can I have it? And, And maybe it keeps going on and on from there. You know, children, they can be very persistent when asking for things that they want, when asking for things that they think are good. You know, trust me, I have experience with this. I got four little askers running around my house who anytime we go to Target, they're not afraid to tell me exactly what they want. But now I'll admit something. When my kids ask me for things, sometimes I get a little annoyed. Sometimes it makes me a little less likely to give them what they want. They say, if you keep asking for me, you're never going to get that bicycle. You're never going to get that alarm system. You're never going to get whatever it is you want if you keep pestering me about it. So the question before us today is, is that how God views it when we pray to him persistently? Is that how God views it when we come to him about the same thing over and over and over again? Does, does God get annoyed with our constant prayers? Does that make him less likely to answer maybe like it does me? Or maybe a simpler version of the question is, how does God want us to pray to him? And that's really what Jesus answers in this Bible section before us today, the one that we're looking at. See, when Jesus told this parable about the unjust judge and the widow, he had a special purpose in mind. You see, he had just spoken about the end of the world. And as that day approaches, he said things are going to get ugly And they're going to get especially ugly for God's people. So then as that day approaches, uh, we have a special need. We even have maybe a duty to pray, to pray continually, to pray without quitting because we've gotten tired of waiting and waiting and waiting for God's answer to become clear. Yes, many times because of the increase in wickedness and evil in the world, it might seem to us, It might seem to God's people that he's uninterested in what's going on in our lives. We might even think that he's deaf to our prayers. But with this parable, Jesus wants us to know that in spite of how things might appear, that first of all, he does hear our prayers. He is indeed coming back again. And not only that, he is interested in our day-to-day welfare and life and that finally he does eventually answer all of our prayers. So let's take a closer look at the parable. There are two main characters in it. We have a judge and a widow. Now in those days, widows societally were for the most part powerless. It was a society that was male dominated. That's just the way that it was as much as maybe our modern sensibilities don't like that idea. That's just how it was. And then you had a judge. Now, normally you'd think that a judge would be regarded as a good man, an upright man, an honest man, one who should be looked up to, one who should be respected, but then we have this judge who was kind of the opposite. He was actually a doubly bad judge because, as Jesus said, he neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And so this judge stood in stark contrast to the way that judges among God's people were supposed to be. See, judges among God's people were supposed to be God's representatives, which meant that they were to deal with people according to justice and equality. They weren't supposed to play favorites. They were supposed to be concerned for the plight of the weak and the powerless. But this judge, he refused to show a single concern in his work about honoring God, about serving his fellow people, or about protecting the weak and the defenseless in his society. And yet that's the judge who this helpless widow had to go to when she was under legal, pre- under legal pressure. Her only protection was the laws of the land. So she comes to this judge again and, and ag- again and again and again with a simple plea, give me justice against my adversary. Now, because she was a widow, uh, she didn't have any extra money that you know, might have greased the wheels a little bit to get this judge to hear her case a little more quickly. And, and the judge... He had no sympathy at all for her in his heart. He was just cold. So for quite some time, he refused. 
But this widow did have one thing at her disposal. She was persistent. She didn't stop her cries to the judge for help. She knew, actually, that the only way that this judge would help her is if she persistently brought her case before him. So every day, she went before that judge and pleaded her case. And she was right in doing so because ultimately, her persistence brought results. The judge didn't care what was right. The judge didn't care what was God-pleasing, but it was getting on his nerves to have this woman coming before him every single day. So he finally decided to settle her case and be done with her. Now it gets even more interesting as we look at this judge's reasoning for finally uh, handling the matter. Yeah, he's sick of seeing her, but he says that he finally hears her case so that she won't eventually attack me. Now when he says attack me, the picture in that word is actually, you know, being pummeled with fists so that you end up with a black eye as a result. But I would make an argument that the word attack me probably takes the picture a little too far. It could also be translated just wear me out. You see, I don't picture this widow physically assaulting the judge. That wouldn't be so profitable for her, right? But I can see her wearing him out every day, verbally attacking him with her words, begging every day for the judge to hear her case. And I think that's what he's talking about. She will wear him out with the verbal pounding that he's taking every day at the hands of this woman, begging him to resolve her case. You see, in those days, uh, courts weren't like they are today. Today, you walk into a courtroom and it's all quiet, it's all rise, you dress nice, you don't speak unless you're spoken to. In those days, not so much. It was a great din of shouting and pushing. You had to try and get the judge's attention so that he would finally hear your case and resolve it. And so this widow knew that the only way for her case to be heard was to be the loudest voice in the room, perhaps even not only the loudest, but the shrillest voice in the room, day after day after day. So finally, after days or maybe weeks or even months of that, the judge finally hears her, he solves her case, but only because of how it'll benefit him. His only interest is his own peace of mind, his own comfort, not hers. So then what do you have in this parable? You have a judge who is wicked, who is evil, who is unrighteous, who is unjust. And what does he do? He finally ends up doing what is right. And why? Simply because this widow was persistent in asking for justice. So with all that in mind, I'd like you to notice the contrast that Jesus sets up with this parable. We have the judge on one side. He's completely unrighteous, completely evil. But then who do we pray to? We have God who is completely righteous, completely good, completely holy, completely faithful. The judge, he has no interest at all in in the welfare of this widow, but our heavenly father, he has a genuine interest in his chosen ones. You know, the people, you and I, that he bought with the blood of his own son. The judge has zero relationship with this widow, but God's people share an amazing blessing of fellowship with our creator. So the application that Jesus makes from this is quite striking. If a wicked, unjust judge like this one will do justice for a widow just because she's persistent, how much more then can you and I expect our Heavenly Father to answer our prayers when we always pray to him without giving up? Jesus concludes, he says, Will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? The answer to that is, of course he won't keep putting them off. Of course he will answer. Of course he will bring deliverance for his people and he'll bring it when the time is right. So we can always pray and never give up in praying. Yes, we can be persistent in our prayers. Yet as I think of my own prayer life and the words that I would use to describe it, maybe one of the last words that I would pick is persistent. Um, As much as I want to, as much as I try, uh, though I desire to pray about certain things and certain people in certain situations, I will readily admit I forget. Um, Might have to do with the four little distractions running around my house all the time. It's probably my fault too. My mind will wander. I'll find myself talking to God once, twice, maybe three times about something and then it kind of slips my mind. Would you say that you have a lot of the same struggles that I do when it comes to prayer? Do you struggle to make a a regular habit out of it, out of praying for the people in your life and such? Do you struggle to keep coming back to God uh, for help with this or that temptation that you really need deliverance from? Do you often fail to keep asking God to remove this or that evil from your life or to strengthen you to to stand through that evil? Do you get tired of asking when the answer doesn't come right away? Do the words, come Lord Jesus, uh, just seem a little stale every time you see a tragedy or a disaster in this world? 
You know, I don't think I'm wrong to say that praying with persistence is probably a struggle for most all of us. We're not persistent in prayer. We don't follow Jesus' direction to always pray and not give up. But one thing this parable does is it helps us understand something. It helps us understand why. Um, why we struggle with being persistent in prayer. And then not only helps us understand why, but it then gives us great power and great resources to overcome in that struggle. You see, we struggle with praying persistently and continually because in a sense we forget. We forget who God is. We forget who the one is that we're praying to and then we also forget who we are. Now we may not necessarily think of God as you know, a dishonest judge who cares nothing about what good and what's good and right, but we can often functionally forget that he is our loving father in heaven who cares about us. And let me give you an example of how this shows. Um, I know that for me, when it comes to friends and family who live far away, I will readily admit to being pretty horrible at keeping in touch with them. A part of that is my own selfishness. You know, I get wrapped up in my own life, my own things, and I get busy and I just don't make time to talk to the people who I care about but there's something else going on there as well. At the same time, I also have this thought in the back of my mind, this doubt that these family and friends, that they really want to hear from me, that I won't just be bothering them if I pick up the phone and call them in the middle of the day. Now the question is, do you ever feel the same way when it comes to talking to God? Do you ever doubt whether he really wants to hear you? Do you ever feel like you'll be bothering him if you go to him again and again with prayer? If that's ever what we think, then we've forgotten that he's our loving father in heaven. At the same time, a part of thinking that God doesn't want to hear from us is forgetting something else. It's forgetting who we are as well. You see, time and time again, the Bible calls you and I a very important title. It calls us God's children. I think about in my life, my children, I'd be hard-pressed to find four people in this world more important to me than the little ones who live in my house. So how much more then does our Heavenly Father feel the same way about us? Yet we often think, speak, and act as though we're unimportant to him. We tell ourselves, well, I can't bother God with my little problems. Or, you know, there's so many other people out there in this world, you know, 4 billion or 5 billion or 6 billion, however it is, so many other people that he'd probably rather hear from than me. Well, why do we feel this way? It's because we do have a sense of our own inadequacy. We do have this sense that you know, we don't deserve to have God hear us. And that sense is rooted in our own sinful hearts. We know deep down, we know that we're not perfect. We know that we don't love God with all our heart. We know that we don't love others as much as we love ourselves. And that's true, isn't it? But yet, in spite of all that, Jesus here uses a special term to describe us. And the term Jesus uses tells us that even in spite of our own unworthiness, God wants to hear from us. You know what term Jesus uses to describe us? He calls us his chosen ones. See, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're here in God's house today, um, it is because of one thing. It's because God chose you to be his own. In the book of Ephesians, it says, God chose us in Jesus Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You see, God chose you. He did this before the world was made. That is to say, before you could have even done a single thing to have earned being chosen, and at the same time, before you could have done a single thing to be disqualified from being chosen. He chose you because he chose you. He chose you because he loves you. He chose you because he wanted you to spend eternity with him. And he chose you for a purpose, to be holy. And he found a way to do that. He found a way to get rid of your sin and to make you holy. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was the one person who was perfect, start to finish, his whole life. He loved God perfectly. He loved other people perfectly. And he even prayed perfectly. And even though he didn't deserve it, he died on a cross. And there on that cross, something marvelous happens. He, God took all of our sin, all of our imperfection, all of our lack of persistence in prayer, all of our mistakes, all of our misdeeds, all of it. And he placed it all upon Jesus. And that's why Jesus suffered and died there. But at the same time, God took that perfect life that Jesus lived, the perfect love that he showed every day of his life, and he placed it upon you and me. And so now when God looks at us, he sees people that he can rightly call holy. He sees people who actually deserve to have their requests brought before God and to be heard by him because we stand in God's presence not on the basis of our own goodness, 
that we stand before him on the basis of Jesus' goodness for us, on the basis of the perfect life that he lived in our place. So if we remember, if we remember that we are God's chosen people and that because of that we're holy, we don't have to worry about whether or not we deserve to be heard by God because we know that he'll hear us. So remember who you are, that you are God's chosen and holy people. Remember that and you won't be afraid. You won't be afraid to always pray and not give up. In addition to remembering who you are, also remember who God is. He's the one who said, I choose you. God's the one who said, I want you to be my own. And then to show you how, how serious, how earnest I am about wanting you to be my own, I will gladly trade my own son for you. Yeah, he can die so that you can live. You see, a God who gives his own son for you, that's a God who loves you more than anything. That's a God who you can talk to about anything. That's a God who you are never bothering. That's a God who wants to hear from you, who wants to hear from you again and again and again. You see, he's not some crooked judge up in the sky. No, more than that, he is your good and loving and merciful and perfect Heavenly Father to whom you can always pray and never give up. So having looked at this parable, in some ways, uh, what Jesus has taught us this morning is that when it comes to our prayers, it's okay to be like children. It's okay to be persistent, to ask again and again. And so don't be afraid to be persistent, or as Jesus himself said it, to always pray and don't give up. So pray. Pray to him about the big things in life. Also pray to him about the small things in life. Pray to ask and pray to give thanks. Pray about your own personal life and pray about the personal lives of others. Pray for your children and pray for your parents. Pray for your congregation and pray for your church body. The simple point is to always pray and don't give up. Because you have a Father in heaven who loves you more than anything else in this world. Yes, always pray and don't give up because you have a Father in heaven who will always act in your best interest. Yes, always pray and don't give up because you have a Father in heaven who loves you so much that he actually gave his Son to save and redeem you. Yes, always pray and never give up because you have a Father in heaven who loves and who's longing to hear from you and who wants to hear from you. So remember that. And you can always pray and never give up also. Amen.